Ten Stag. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Hi, sorry, hi, Nagla. But this, I think this mic is, it sounds nice. You hear me? <laughs> no. Everyone can hear me in the Zoom call, but not in the room. <laughs> Wait a second, please. Hello, hello. Now we can see you sort of clear. Hello, hello, hello. Yes, we're fixing here the audio for the room. In the Zoom call is so okay, but it's not working in the room. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, now we are we are missing the audio guy. <laughs> we are missing the, the audio guy for the room, so maybe I we could start and I, I could talk louder. It's okay. Okay. Let's uh, start. I will just talk a little bit louder for the room. It's okay like that. You can hear me. Okay, let's start. Well, hello everybody. Welcome. Sorry for the delays. We are the A Plus Alliance for Inclusive Algorithms and the Feminist AI Research Network. We are very happy to participate again in IDF. Now in Addis Abeba. In this session, we are going to share our last year's work in this journey of reflecting on and building feminist AI. Also, we are going to give an advance of what is coming for the next year. Join us, share your comments and our questions in the chat and we are going to be happy to read them and then and reply. Let me introduce my colleagues in this session. We have in Mexico, Paola Ricaurte from Tecnológico de Monterrey. She's leader of uh, Latin America and the Caribbean Fair Regional Hub. Thanks, Paola, for being here, even though it's very late in Mexico. In Thailand, we have Soraj Fonda Ladarum uh, from Chula Longhorn University. She's co-leader of the Southeast Asia Fair Regional Hub. We have in Egypt, Nagla Risk from Access to Knowledge for Development Center at the American University in Cairo. Nagla is the leader of Middle East and North Africa Fair Regional Hub. I, th I don't see here, I'm not sure if Kaylin is here in the room. Could someone confirm me? I think she is not, but maybe she will be joining us soon. Kaylin is, uh, should be right now in Dakar. She's usually based in Geneva, Switzerland. Is uh, founder of Women at the Table and the A Plus Alliance, co-leader of the Fair Network. And also we have uh, from our sister network in Africa, Lord Pearl and Ernest in Webasi. Hope we get them soon in the call. We can start um, uh, now talking a little bit about the, the alliance. How, what about A+, plus? What is, why are we working on this in feminist AI? And we gave like a little introduction. We are working on feminist AI because we all know that AI has the potential to improve the quality of life of people. But this technological tool also has a lot of risks of reproducing existing biases and reproducing colonial structures in the digital world, like concentration of resources, opportunities, and wealth, hierarchization between racialized and sexualized groups, class stratification around models of production, 
silencing and extractivism of many kinds. In this moment, it's crucial to reflect on who is developing AI, who benefits and who gets harms from AI, from which perspective the tech is built. We think AI also implies we have to consider the process of producing technology in a broader sense. It's not only the software, we have to think where the software is running, how the infrastructure was built, who maintains it, who participates in the software design process, how an app, a tool is governed, how is going, who is going to pay for it, among other questions. There is a limited number of places for tech creation, mostly in California and China, and this implies that their cultures are the only ones that are being codified. Lots of other visions are not being taken into account. The majority of the world is getting out of this conversation, so we need an urgency to make a shift on how technology is built. With feminist AI, we are thinking on how AI should look like, and we want to implement technology with the vision of feminist movements, marginalized communities, and in general, other perspectives that dispute the hegemonic point of view of how AI and algorithm decision-making software is being constructed and used. Now I would like to turn to Paola to, to go deeper on decolonialism, indigenous thinking, the Latin American feminist movement, and how this interrelates with what we want to achieve. Thank you, Paola. We will continue with uh, Nagla. Let's talk about feminist AI from a Mena, Mina perspective.
Thank you, Nagla. Now let's move to, to Asia with Soraj. Soraj, you have been working with a Buddhist perspective on technology. So would you like to tell us about how the Buddhist perspective combines with AI, please?
Thank you. Thank you, Sorat. Now let's talk a little bit about what happened in year one of the project. Uh, this FAIR network, Feminist AI Research Network, works in, a, in a three phases uh, basics. We start with a call for proposals for uh, articles, then the articles present their results and uh, we select the, uh, the ones that go to prototype uh, stage, prototype phase, and then to a pilot phase. So we go uh, papers, prototypes, and pilots. And uh, in last year, we have two cohorts of papers, and now we have one cohort in, in prototypes. So let's talk a, a little bit about how, how the, the first year uh, go. Let's start with uh, Paola, about uh, the projects. How, how were the projects in that region for the first cohort?
Thank you. Thank you, Paola. That's th those were the projects of the first cohort. They start working in the first part of this year, and the prototypes are now, uh, they're working right now on their prototypes. Also, we have a second cohort of uh, articles for Latin America region. Right now, they are working on four projects, one conversational agent to support interpreters of indigenous languages in, the, in Mexico also. Uh, there is another project where they are working with a AI, AI, AI crowd work with a gender perspective. perspective. They are trying to build tools to support and to help the workers to, to improve the way they work in order to have a better quality of life. Also, we have a project that is a, a, design, a redesign of a model of formulating data science projects using a feminist criteria. So they are working with um, Web using web web facilitating workshops in order to create and, uh, and uh, redesign this this uh, this uh, formulation projects, and the fourth project is uh, a chatbot. Uh, actually, it's a, a two solutions based in AI applied to monitoring, response, and systematization situations of digital gender violence. This project is developed by a Chilean uh, team. And they are working in this uh, chatbot to, to identify uh, gender violence and also to help to, uh, um, to identify the situations and then to um, send messages to alert authorities or alert communities. These four uh, teams are working right now in these uh, articles uh, phases. And we also have another uh, uh, project, another team that is right now in the work in the prototype phase. This one is the, the Derecho Digital, is the one that Paola was just mentioning. Right now they are starting to facilitate workshops in order to try to implement this feminist perspective that they work in the previous in the article phase. Um, also we have uh, two more um, um, teams working in this cohort. They are from Asia. Soraj could tell us uh, more about these projects.
actually does not right now
of course, uh, we're learning from our partners and there are incredible uh, areas of uh, participation for the region. And my hope and expectation is that this would actually um, would come out the earlier challenges I mentioned, the developmental challenges, the needs that we have for a positive and impactful role for uh, feminist AI. I'm hoping that these areas, the developmental areas, will come up. But uh, for the moment, we are starting, uh, as I mentioned, a series of, of workshops um, uh, starting um, in December, and expanding, actively engaging uh, with, with members, and expanding uh, the network, uh, and in creating a MENA, you know, a network of, of uh, researchers and activists and, and technologists and, uh, you know, um, interested parties working on uh, feminist AI. That's at the moment uh, what we uh, are planning to do immediately. And then the next phase, uh, maybe uh, later this meeting, I will talk more about what uh, we are hoping to, uh, what we are expecting as uh, papers, um, you know, as these topics for uh, papers, prototypes, and pilots. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nagla. Can you hear me? I'm going to try again. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, it's not working in the Zoom call. They cannot hear me in the Zoom call. Hello, can you hear me in the Zoom? Hello, hello. It was working. I think the Microsoft is working. It, it's a problem in the mixer because they have to, to put this audio in the Zoom call. Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me in the Zoom? No. I send the question to Paola. Um, yeah, I, I think that one difference uh, that we notice with the experience of various cohorts, cohort is that um, projects that include communities from the beginning are projects that really um, capture the um, needs of those communities. So that's why we want teams made up made up of diverse people, uh, but also uh, teams that include um, the communities that are intended to, uh, that these technologies are intended to serve. So uh, in our experience, um, um, when, when technologies are not developed taking into account the communities from the first uh, from from the very beginning from the design these technologies usually tend to reinforce those uh, structural uh, structural um, uh, differences and, and discriminations that we are trying to avoid so in our um, in our calls we are trying to um, promote diversity in all these uh, senses. Diversity in terms of disciplines, diversity in terms of uh, trajectories, diversity in terms of 
the communities that are involved in the in the project itself. So I think that this is basically a, a, the main difference of this school and and other calls that are trying to develop technologies. Um, we are trying to uh, embed diversity and inclusion from the beginning, from the very conception and, and design of the technology. Thanks, Paola. Can you hear me in the Zoom? Uh, I am. Uh, I uh, Hani would like me to speak about uh, the project expectations for the next call. So allow me to take the next few minutes to do that. As I mentioned, uh, we are having a workshop in December to uh, uh, announce the network to uh, you know solicit interest and expand uh, the, the knowledge about the network uh, about the, the uh, feminist AI for our uh, regional network. Then the call for papers will come out in January. Uh, after introducing uh, the network, as I said, in December. Uh, we are learning from our uh, partners. So uh, from, from Paula, Hani, and Soraj, the experiences are very, very useful for us. We are learning that we uh, would like to have the community involved uh, you know, from the beginning, uh, the civil society involved from the beginning. Uh, so basically, uh, what we have in mind is um, we the call for papers, I would will come will uh, go out to, uh, you know to different communities to the larger networks we would hope to have uh, sort of a, a partnership from the, the you know uh, including the community together the civil society uh, uh, i would hope that uh, and expect that uh, the, the topics to be dealt with would really address the uh, priorities and the needs in the region so i would expect that perhaps language biases would, would come out as you know we'd hope to to look to find uh, you know, proposals that include tools that address, for example, uh, language biases. And then the third and part uh, in this region, as I mentioned in my first uh, introduction, is the, what relates to work in the region. As I mentioned, we have uh, high rates of unemployment of youth, of educated, of women, and, and um, uh, low rates of uh, labor participation. And we also have uh, large portions of informal economies. We have a huge informal sector in our region. So what I would hope for is that we find ways whereby uh, you know the proposals, papers, and, and eventually uh, the, the, the prototypes and the pilots would address these issues. Uh, FinTech, for example, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurship, um, platform-mediated cloud work, and platform-mediated groundwork, the gig economy, uh, uh, mobility of women, which was uh, you know mentioned earlier uh, by Suraj, is very very safety for mobility for women. This is an important issue in this part of the world. Intersectional biases as well, uh, uh, as mentioned uh, by, by Paula. Family law is an important, is something to be tackled in, in this part of the world. We hope in our uh, uh, workshop to sort of discuss the different issues and solicit interest, but the, the priorities and, and the, the research questions and the research issues have to come organically, grounds up from the presenters, so the proposals. People will propose this, uh, uh, you know, the papers which will eventually uh, develop into the prototypes and the pilots. My hope is that we uh, trigger enough interest and uh, enough buzz about the network in a way that we will, uh, you know, we would be receiving uh, interesting proposals that address priorities, developmental priorities, inclusion priorities, uh, and also uh, to engage different uh, stakeholders, including the community and, and civil society as well. So uh, we're very much looking forward to that. Uh, and uh, please stay tuned for announcements from this end. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Nagla. Uh, yes, so it's my turn to speak, right? Uh, and what we have been uh, looking for in proposals uh, during the second year of the project, firstly, you know, in this region, and, and it uh, reflects uh, what has been said from other regions by like Paula and Nagla also. Uh, firstly, we would like to look for uh, more diversity of proposals. Uh, we only had to propose to we only had two successful proposals uh, for the first year and we would very much like to see 
more successful proposals uh, in the second year, including those from other regions, other countries in Southeast Asia. Also, for example, Malaysia or Vietnam or uh, Cambodia, uh, you know, uh, these countries, which uh, have not been uh, represented much uh, during the first uh, cohort, in the first year of the project. Uh, that said, uh, the content, we would like, of course, we would like to look for proposals on how AI uh, could be uh, developed in such a way as to uh, contribute to social justice, to equality, to women empowerment, uh, to uh, the you know how how uh, e equality how 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 inequality is diminished, including economic inequality, social inequality, and so on. And uh, projects can this broad uh, outline and find their own uh, take on the issue. For example, uh, the team from. Thailand and, and the Philippines that I have told you about, they just come up on their own on, on uh, mobility for women and how uh, work a lot to help women with disabilities. So they have their own agenda. And, and it's uh, really fortunate that uh, this agenda kind of mesh with our, our overall concern. So uh yes we are really looking forward to receiving uh good proposals from all uh countries within the southeast asian region for the for the next cohort of the project thank you thank you Soraj. i think the in the zoom participants cannot hear me but i will talk to the room now for a little bit this next call for proposals as we mentioned is going to open in march next year and uh, one of the ideas that we have is that we are going to change a little bit the focus of the call for proposals not to to put the emphasis on ai but on algorithmic decision making we think that that is like a broader approach in order to seek for more uh, teams to participate. So we encourage participation of our teams from these regions, Latin America, Middle East, North Africa, and Southeast Asia. Uh, we want the teams to be um, uh, formed of a technical person, a social science or, or, or humanities uh, background, and, uh, and persons from a community. Uh, as Paola mentioned before, it's, it's very important for us to have a, a a community involved in the process of designing that technology is we have to work this kind of projects in an horizontal uh, way it's not like a transfer of technology we want the teams that work together with the communities and with the specialists in order to achieve this this syst little systematic changes in the in a lot of of thematics as the as the regional leaders were mentioning so 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 yes There is another sister network of this project that works in Africa, that all the, the, the African uh, continent. It's called, um, let me check, it's called um, Artificial Intelligence for Development in Africa, AI4D Africa. Uh, so they are working like in a similar approach to, to, the, to the network that we have, the fair network, but in Africa. Uh, we invited two, two members of this network to this session, but unfortunately they, they didn't came. They have technical difficulties, but um, yes, yes. We are working this, uh, this feminist approach is, is include women, include marginalized communities. So it's like also in a, in a broad perspective. It's not focused only on the, for example, only on women problems. We are also interested in marginalized communities, for example, people that live in informal settlements or communities that are like abandoned from governments. And we want to, to implement different points of view 
using uh, software. So, for example, how a community of Garifunas in Honduras resolves their problems, maybe we could try to make an algorithm to work with that kind of problems, to find solutions in that way. Uh, so part of the, of the idea that we want to, to encourage is like technical people to, to, to be in contact with people from social sciences and communities to listen, to listen a lot to the, the problems of the communities and to, to go out of the box and rethink how the, the, the technical careers teach. For example, how many women you read in the textbooks, how many black people, how many indigenous, how many uh, Latinos, always the, the textbooks are lit in Costa Rica. It's only uh, it's United States or Europe li literature, no? Only authors from the global north. So maybe we, th we need to rethink uh, how we are teaching computer science in order to create different kind of projects. You have another question? Yes, well, it, it's, we think that we, we put the focus on the communities because governments right now have a lot of power and they have like the partnerships with big tech companies. So we think that we have to build a, a resistance software, a resistance alternative, a digital resistance. And the only way to do that is to empower communities, work with technical people, work with people from humanities in order to, uh, we have to like to, uh, like to go beyond the traditional way we use technology in communities. This also implies that we have to build confidence between these groups because sometimes, at least, for example, feminist movements don't feel comfortable working with tech people because tech people had a lot of biases, no? As I was mentioning, when we, when we learn uh, technology, when we learn computer science, we are learning a lot of biases and we naturalize that biases as part of the technical atmosphere a technical environment so we have like to rethink we have to think again how can we use computer science but for our problems for our communities so i think that i don't have an, an answer but our, our point of view is that we have to work with communities not exactly with governments no in this point at least i don't know if we have more questions No, you, you raise your hand first. I, I am sorry, I'm just going to say in the chat that we are in the um, thank you very much for this uh, session and for the topic you chose. I was wondering for the proposals, the criteria of people applying to you, are you looking for uh, researchers that already had research before? Are they practitioners? Are they PhD students? Uh, what kind of participants are you looking for? We are, we are we are very open on what kind of, of participants. We are not exactly looking for experienced uh, researchers because we want to encourage uh, first of all, communities that work with, with uh, researchers. We want to work also with activists. It's not necessarily an academic focus. When we, when we say papers, it's not exactly an academic paper. It could be like a dissemination paper, but we want some a little bit of rigorosity you know, on how to, 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 to focus or to, or to explain what the approach is going to be to create this technology. So the papers are very uh, um, implement oriented. Um, but yes, we, we encourage all kinds of groups. The most important part is, well, a condition is that the, the principal investigators, investigators must be from the global majority, the global south. That's a must. They can work 
with a researcher from, from the Global North, that's okay, but the main, uh, the principal investigator should be from the South. In these three regions, Latin America and the Caribbean, North, East, uh, North Africa and Middle East, and Southeast Asia. And uh, we encourage that the, that the researchers work with uh, communities. That's very important for us, but there is no, no, requ no, no specific requirements. Hi, I may ask whether I can ask a question to one of the speakers. Yes. Okay. But um, um, I need to, to, to okay. write them the question because they are not listening. Okay. Um, so my question is um, to um, the speaker from Thailand. Yes. Uh, Sorai, I'm sorry, I can't remember his last name. Soraj. Soraj. Okay. Okay. By the way, this is my, my question is, okay. I'm very impressed by his emphasis on non-Western perspective and the intellectual resources from the Global South. And one of his points was to use AI to, um, to the process of decolonization. And I'd like to know whether he can give any specific examples in this regard. And my second question is actually to you um, or any other speakers, it's possible is um, can you tell us about the common mistakes that applicants who send the proposals in the past few years often made so that we can avoid making the same mistakes? Thank you. Thank you. I sent the, the, the question to Soresh. Let me see if he, well, if he starts talking, I will just <laughs> stop. Um, well, we, we have two rounds of call for proposals and uh, both were different. We are also learning in this process. It's part of this experience. It's like a very experimental process. So in the first two rounds, we were not so concerned about the important role of the communities. So we have like uh, proposals that only have this like a, a, a lot of academic perspective and they get lost in the communities. No? So we, I, we feel that that's part of the problems that we faced in this first year, but we are addressing that for the next call for proposals, uh, including as requirement this participation of a community. So that, that could be one of the, of the common failures of the project, but could be our fault, <laughs> not the team's fault. Um, another thing that, that, uh, that could, be, uh, uh, could be improved is that Maybe some of the teams uh, focus a lot on the technology. Uh, it's Soresh because I sent a message to Soresh with her question, but he's not listening to me. <laughs> I will say to him to go on. Yes, I think so. Okay, I just got uh, the message from Jaime. Uh, the audio from Jaime is not coming to me, so uh, there is a time lag between the message uh, from him. Uh, example of the colonial AI, a very uh, interesting, very, very good question. Uh, there can be many ways in which uh, AI can be part of the uh, decolonialization. Uh, one way is to look through, uh, look at the colonization as not only as you know political uh, of a country on another country, we be colonizer and we colonize. Another way is to look at uh, this attempt at uh, colonizing in in a more subtle way. For example, uh, in such a way that create patterns of uh, oppression or inequality or or the mindset that things that you know uh, I am always on the dis uh, disadvantage side and there is no way to escape this situation uh, I think uh, the more interesting and more important part of uh, the discussion uh, discourse on the colonial AI is to find ways to get rid of of this this uh, mindset uh, and AI could 
uh, they have uh, made it possible and that's the challenge for us in the project for example as in the mobility for women project uh, instead of AI kind of you know accentuating the existing inequality AI in this project uh, is being looked at is being worked on in such a way that uh, we create uh, ways in, uh, to, to empower women so that they can feel safer and they can become actually safer. So that, that uh, could be uh, regarded as a way of decolonializing AI also. Thanks, Soresh. And we have one more question over there. I think it's uh, the last one because we are almost on time. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Emmanuel Yeda from Uganda, and uh, um, I'm from uh, uh, African Union. Uh, my question is uh, actually, yeah, it's a question. My question is uh, about: uh, Is there a point uh, there, you, like uh, you have helped maybe those students who have applied for? Okay, who have submitted in the applications uh, in regards to their projects, like? Uh, is there a point you have helped them in uh, protecting their ideas? Because there is a way AI is uh, confusing in in form of protection of their like those systems which are using AI. And then another thing is uh, uh, on the ground you find that uh, there are students or people who have uh, AI projects, but they are not yet aware about uh, this form of application. Uh, like which strategy have you put on ground at least to to uh to improve on uh like the awareness of uh the availability of these opportunities to these people yes yes Thank i you. think that's very important and it's uh uh the the people that should address that problem are the teachers the professors we i i as professor we as professors have to work that issue because students are not aware in in a lot of universities the students are only working in to 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 fit in the big tech industries for the big tech problems and they are not aware of the the community they live on uh, problems uh the, you have re uh, actually I've come up with it even with another question because uh, if you say that the professors, does it mean that uh, it is only students who are supposed to apply or even people who have their own, like a startup, maybe companies like that? Yes, yes, both. Uh, startups, uh, activists, students, professors, research groups, we are open to participate. We are open in terms of participation. We want uh, the, we are not closed only to to certain uh, public for participating in this kind of projects. Thank you. Sir. Okay. I think we are on time. I really appreciate and your uh, patience with all the technical difficulties we face in this opening session of the day zero. But uh, thank you very much for the for the for being here. And in case you have any other question, I will be around here all the week. So have a very good day. See you. Thank you.
Yes.
Um, so as I say, Professor Chagona uh, will kick us off with an overview of what the CMM is, as well as his organization, C3SA. Uh, and then we'll hand over to Chris, who will talk about Malawi's uh, experience of conducting a CMM, both in 2016 and then again in 2020, I believe. And then we'll uh, hear from Colonel Barros in Brazil, through a translator, who will talk about uh, Brazil's experience of conducting a CMM. Uh, before handing over to the audience for uh, a Q&A segment. And with that, I'll, I'll hand over to Wallace. As uh, Minas introduced, my name is Wallace Chigoni, and I work for the University of Cape Town, and also the director for C3SA. I wonder if we can have the slides. So, um, so just an, I mean, an overview of our C3SA before I talk about the CMM. C3SA, the Cybersecurity Capacity Center for Southern Africa, is a center, is a research center at the University of Cape Town. No, Mm -hmm. 
Dimension 3 is on capacity building and knowledge. Dimension 4 is legal and regulatory framework on cybersecurity. And Dimension 5 is on standards and framework. So we do assess maturity along those five dimensions. So I guess you could be thinking those are still like bad level. They are pretty much level. So what we do for each dimension, we break it down into like a sub level in what we call practice. So, for example, if you look at dimension one, the cyber security policy and strategy, which focuses on uh, where the country is, uh, kind of look at the greatness and the ability and the policies. So, that speaks into five parts, into four parts. So, for example, look at national Are there? Are they up to standard? And so on. Um, dimension four is on the uh, legal and legal frameworks. So I know that uh, so I'm kind of be careful here because lawyers say that there's no gap in, uh, in, uh, in, in the, in the, um, in the laws. But we're kind of saying, okay, you can use any law to do anything, but have you gone a step ahead and have specific laws and regulations? Pertaining to cyber security, uh, we got things about uh, child protection online, scams online. So we are assessing whether you have moved past, uh, and uh, are the the people in that justice system equipped with uh, with the skills? So that's what we assess on uh, crimes and so on. The the last dimension, dimension five, is about uh, standards. So we know there are international standards on cyber security. So we are assessing whether a country is abiding to those. Are they aware of those? 
is the national kind of Bureau of Standards also monitoring cybersecurity like software and hardware? Are there uh, some controls so you do assess on, on those metrics? So to recap, we've said they're dimensional, they're five dimensional, that the measures are split into factors and the factors are split into aspects. So when we assess uh, maturity, we engage with the aspects to say, how far have you gone with this aspect? So we could score you, we could score a country as either startup, maybe it's there, it's kind of embryonic stage. Or if it's there, maybe there are different stages. And if you are fully compliant, then maybe it's called a governance stage. Okay, so basically that's the same thing I'm writing. It's kind of like we've got a table, no, okay, if a country is doing this, then that's governance. If they are doing this, kind of like a, a checklist which you, we use to determine the score where it could place a country. And it's kind of, it's kind of like sort of important part of this because we do assess different countries and different people do the assessments. So if you're using one benchmark, it's much more uniform and much more you know, consistent. I'm not talk about this, but this is an example of uh, uh, the, 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 the indicators we use to assess. Okay, so what's the process like? So the process is often initiated by the country. So a country will say, we need a CMM assessment for our country. So we would then begin looking at that country and kind of look at what we can find online or we can find in books about the country. And then the next stage is for us to go to the country and have a discussion in the country. So this will be done through focus groups. So we'll be meeting with people from different sectors to gather information about the country. And based on that information, now I mean, there'll be a report to say, this country is on this level. And further to that, now once we know where the country is, and we know where they're doing from, where they're not doing from, we're going to provide recommendations to say for this factor, if you can do A, B, C, D, you could improve your score to the, to the next level. So I'm conscious of time. So the important thing is that the assessment is not overall, but it's per factor. So we know for dimension one, factor one, this is where we are. So we don't give you one overall score. Okay, so I think I can close up. So I think important to say that same has been done by different people. It's been done for many countries, and the numbers are there. I think uh, we do some are doing in Africa. Our colleagues do in other other parts of the world. Um, so the I should mention that the same uh, itself kind of gets improved all the time. We engage with people, with other stakeholders to get feedback on what's working and what's not and, and what's not working and how this can be improved. So I think I can stop there and then we can maybe can engage further on questions later. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Wallace. Uh, I think we'll now move over to Chris and those controlling the slides. Um, do you have the clicker? It should just come up next. Uh, thank you, Sam. Yes, my name is Chris Mkobanda. Um, I'm from Malawi. Um, I work with the Bank of Lusaka. So I'll make a presentation on the uh, case of Malawi. And then we'll go for the code of conduct to the uh, CMM, which, as Sam said, was held twice, in 2016 and also in 2021. Yeah. Can I have a slide? Oh. Um, basically, the presentation will go through those uh, points. Now, uh, first, we did the CMM in 2016. Uh, this one was uh, facilitated by CTO. That's 
uh, Commonwealth State Communication Organization, and is uh, also sponsored by Foreign Commonwealth Office uh, to Government of Malawi. Um, basically, uh, the key objective was to demand the current cybersecurity posture of Malawi, and also highlighting a series of challenges and opportunities in the country, and further to develop the national cybersecurity strategy aimed at addressing uh, the challenges. Uh, it was a consultative process through workshop and questionnaire. And uh, this one, um, the major output was the development of the national cybersecurity strategy. Uh, because at that time, um, we didn't have any strategy in place. So the issues which was, were raised, as he has explained on those pillars, five pillars, uh, and a strategy was developed to address those challenges. Um, and uh, also, um, it, it, it was further to look at to finalize and adopt the national cybersecurity strategy for Malawi, of course, to operationalize the national set, uh, to improve cybersecurity awareness, and also operationalize implement of the e-transaction and the cybersecurity bill. Uh, and also deploy cyber security certification program in the public investment and all the uh, colleges. Uh, basically, at this time, when we were doing the strategy, I, I mean the CMM, we had a, a bill in place on electronic transaction and cyber security. However, it took time to be approved. So I would say within the process, uh, it was also a, a way of trying to communicate to the policymakers and uh, uh, and also the uh, uh, member of, of parliament to look at if this um, um, bill critically so that it can be quickly be uh, passed in parliament. Well, I think uh, the top one, the uh, heading is not really being seen, but now in terms of uh, stakeholders who are concerted, uh, there were all the private sector, public sector, academia, and also finance sector, as he has put that uh, you target a specific group to look at their maybe uh, their um, comments and also listen to them uh, for all of those pillars which he has presented. So this is the uh, sectors which were consulted when they were doing the work, the CMM. Now, this is the second CMM which we did in 2020. Uh, it was funded by uh, um, uh, World Bank. Of course, uh, we have a digital money project. It's a World Bank funded project. And also a consultant from the World Bank which facilitated the, what, the, uh, the, 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 the assessment. Um, main objective of the uh, exercise was to enable the country to understand its cyber security capacity posture, as indicated. Uh, uh, previous also, to strategically prioritize investment in cybersecurity capacities, and also to uh, outcome was a report with the recommendations. Uh, again, it was a consultative process and online due to COVID situation. Uh, this one we did in 2020 when there was COVID, so mainly the consultations were online. And I, I remember we had about uh, 15 sessions different sessions having uh, targeting different uh, sectors and the institutions. Uh, if those were some of the institutions which were consulted in the second uh, uh, exercise, that's public sector, private, finance, academia, uh, and others. Uh, basically, um, the finding uh, of the second one on cyber security policy and strategy. Uh, this uh, strategy dimension of Malawi was assessed as startup to establish. Uh, basically, this was looking at uh, from the previous uh, assessment, which we did in 2016. Uh, cash and society, uh, uh, this one was judged to, to range between the startup and offer also formative stages. Uh, because there are uh, different stages where you can be graded depending on the activities or the issues which you have, you have, you have been addressing on those pillars. 
uh, then on cyber security education training and skills. This one will be that uh, 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 trainings and skills capacity in Malawi ranges from startup to establish again. Um, the point is which look at uh, the trainings, maybe the courses, programs um, done in universities and colleges related to cyber security. So this is how it was assessed. Uh, Lego and regular from Mike, overall the Lego and Lego for capacity of Malawi was assessed as formative to establish. Look at now, it's, it's a formative to establish. It means we, we are are at least stronger on that one compared to the other areas. And also standards, organization and technology, Malawi capacity in standard uh, and uh, organization and technology was assessed to range from still start up to the formative stages. Uh, basically, this is uh, maybe just uh, graphically how we were related in 20, uh, 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 20. Uh, on those all of those peers. Uh, the, the recommendations which were made, uh, one was reviewing the registration and the current strategy, uh, improve cyber security awareness, introducing cyber training courses in higher education, strength, strengthening the domestic law enforcement capacity on, on cyber crime, improving international cooperation mechanism to combat cyber crime. Uh, basically, that's what I would share, and uh, mainly what I would say that uh, the second uh, seminar which was done, indeed, it pointed a lot of things, and one of the issues which we have concentrated as a country is now to um, come up with a different legislation um, to address the same like cyber crime, uh, data protection, and others, and these have already uh, been, uh, uh, some have already been developed, maybe I will just parameter to pass but it's, it's, it's a response to the report which was produced in 2020. Basically, that's what I would say. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, we'll now move over to our remote colleague who's joining from Brazil uh, incredibly early there, so a big thanks to him. Um, just checking, Luis and Colonel Barros, can you hear us okay? Are you ready to come in? Do we need to enable them, uh, the microphone, to be able to talk into the room? There we go. Um, so we've got this. We've got you on the screen, Colonel. I think we're just trying to get you hooked up to the mic here in the room. And then uh, team at the back, if you wouldn't mind putting the slides back up to where we were. And then um, uh, Luis or Colonel, if you could just tell me when to uh, go next slide. I've got the clicker here. Um, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do it whenever, whenever you indicate. Um, and with that, oops, we are ready for you to kick off. Please go ahead. Hey. Bom dia a todos, um bom dia aqui do Brasil. Perguntam se me escutam bem. Sorry to interrupt. I think we we should have a translator. Um, can you please enable the translation function? Uh, so, Luis, uh, we should be we should be hearing you. Please please jump in. Em condições, Luis, posso iniciar? Uh, sorry, everyone, we might just need to give it a couple of minutes while we figure out how to get Colonel Barros's remarks translated from Portuguese uh, into English for this audience. Well, good, mo good morning, everyone. Good morning from Brazil. My name is Colonel Augusto Barros. I'm the deputy director for uh, the uh, department of uh, for the institutional security office at the president's office. And I'll talk about our experience, our challenges uh, here in Brazil in the area of uh, cyber security. Next slide, please.
next. Are you getting the one with the uh, map of Brazil on, Louise? We've, uh, we've currently got the map outlining the internet penetration and size of Brazil. Is that, is that the same for you? I can't see the chat room, but perhaps you're on mute. Although I understand that Brazil is an interesting Uh, Louise, your remarks aren't quite coming through okay. Maybe it's a connection issue. Can I just check that yeah. you've got the same slide up in front of you and uh, as far as you're aware, everything everything's okay? Because if so, then it's probably just uh, a connection issue and you're, you're not coming through properly. Uh, Sam, uh, this is Louise. Can you hear me? I can now, yes. Okay. Brazil is an interesting uh, case study because uh, in addition to the federal district, Brazil has 26 states spread over uh, more than 8 million square kilometers. And each of these federative units has its own peculiarities in terms of climate and infrastructure. Uh, the Brazilian population is over 200 million people and 81% of Brazilian households are connected to the internet. This is a very relevant piece of information because we understand that uh, social media are some of the most important tools identified in Brazil as a source or a tool for uh, crimes in Brazil. Next slide, please. When you think about the government, uh, there are nearly uh, 9,000 autonomous systems, but we also have the previous slide, please. It seems that uh, some participants cannot see uh, the slides. Uh, okay, that's probably a, that. an issue with the online room. Um, if, uh, Colonel Augusto, you have the slides up in front of you, then perhaps share your screen on the, on the Zoom call. Uh, we've got the slides up currently here. Um, and team in the back, if you're able to enable uh, Augusto, to share both the slides on the call and in the room. You can do that. Then please, please go ahead. So can we get um, Colonel Augusto permission rights to share his slides uh, with the room, both here and online? The Brazilian government has over one million uh, civ civil and uh, military uh, servants. And this creates a particularly favorable uh, aspect to uh, address uh, cyber incidents in Brazil. Next slide, please. So we move to the next slide. It's now the organogram of the Information Security Department. Yeah. 
their side is the focal point within the government regarding uh, cyber security and cyber and information security. So it's divided into three general coordination offices. Uh, the first one is called uh, CTI Gov that coordinates cyber protection and ha plays an important role in addressing uh, alerts and um, providing timely action and is also a point of attention for Brazilian society. The General Coordination Office for uh, Information Security and Management is the one that develops uh, standards and regulations and the one that uh, deals with um, security and uh, clearance addresses and uh, treats uh, confidential information and provides um, for secure um, exchange of information. Next slide, please. So this uh, type of structure enables us to uh, provide one of the main outputs of uh, GSI, and this is uh, linked to each of the CMM dimensions. And the recommendations included in the Oxford uh, report, they were clear and concise that enabled us to develop actions to uh, address and meet those recommendations. And CMM has proved to be a very effective tool to address the issues that were identified in Brazil for each of the dimensions. Thank you. Next slide, please. We're now on the slide with lots of organizations and institutions pointing towards Brazil. Uh, I think there might be a slight lag with them loading online. So I'll talk about some actions that we took uh, based on the uh, Oxford uh, report. The government, uh, through uh, our office, the GSI, has expanded its uh, dealings and its uh, collaboration with international uh, organizations that also deal with the same uh, aspects, usually through MOUs. And uh, an example is, uh, for example, the uh, OAS and a number of different organizations. And our collaboration work with all these international organizations and countries has added significant value to uh, the work that we do in our department and has enabled us to uh, progress significantly, uh, not only at CTIR, Gov, and also the other coordination offices. Uh, next slide, please. So we've now got the one with the national policy on information security at the top pointing down. So GSI uh, has done uh, significant work at a high level uh, legal uh, framework. We have also uh, produced proposals and national plans to manage cyber incidents and also to provide security for critical infrastructure in line with uh, our CMM. And this is now at the final stages of approval uh, within the Brazilian government. Thank you. Next slide, please. So now the slide with the strategic actions from the normative baseline. In addition to the national plans that I cited, the national policy for cybersecurity is uh, included in a bill of law that's going to, submit, to be submitted to the Brazilian Congress. And it's also in line with uh, what is proposed under the CMM. And some of these actions or some of the goals of this new legislation 
uh, to strengthen cyber governance actions, establish the centralized governance model, promote a participatory collaborative uh, environment uh, involving or engaging the public sector, the private sector and society, raising the level of government protection, raising the level of protection for national uh, critical infrastructure, enhancing the partnerships between uh, academia, private and public sectors and society, and of course raising the level of maturity for society as a whole in terms of um, cyber security. And this is of course our main challenge. Next slide please. Another initiative in the case of Brazil that had significant impact was the creation of the Federal Cyber Incident Management Network, uh, which is a sectoral coordination instance to uh, address specific threats uh, to these specific sectors and to uh, provide a response through this organization, a more timely and appropriate response, and thus uh, be able to provide a safer and faster service to society. It also had a very positive outcome in terms of uh, the efficiency of communications uh, of cyber incidents. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, regarding uh, regulatory issues, at a lower level, we have uh, started updating all our normative instructions, uh, taking into account emerging technologies, and it's important to bear in mind uh, that uh, if we want to be state-of-the-art, we need to take into account these emerging technologies so that we can face specific threats to each sector. And that's why I said earlier that the federal network is uh, providing uh, significant support to these actions. Next slide, please. we can say that there have been significant advances over the past three years, but still, that there's still a lot to do and many challenges to face. In order to do that, uh, uh, it's important to understand that these actions are taken with a view to expanding our national and international partnerships, uh, keep our uh, regulations and laws uh, always up to date and uh, address uh, emerging or specific technologies, launch campaigns that enable us to provide uh, increased awareness on this topic at different levels and build capacity in our human resources and try to establish processes and systems that are aimed at providing greater security and this would increase our maturity and the resilience of our networks, not only for the government, but for society as a whole. In particular, for uh, essential uh, and critical uh, areas and infrastructure, and this would benefit the whole of Brazilian society. Next slide, please. Well, that said, I try to present a very brief overview in the time that I was allotted and I hope that during the debate, during the Q&A session, I can uh, clarify any issues that have not been um, clear. And CMM has been a very important partner for us, helping us to develop tools and systems so that we can put our action plans into uh, action and consequently reach our uh, 
cybersecurity and is uh, expanded maturity in our cybersecurity. And in sum, we want to have a safe, reliable, inclusive, and resilient cyberspace, not only for the government, but for the whole of Brazilian society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Colonel Barros, and thank you, Luis and uh, Chris, for your translation services today. Um, I will now move to the question and answer segment. I'll start with the room, and then if we have any questions come through on the chat, I have a, a colleague who will forward them to me on here. Um, but does anyone have any questions for any of our panelists on what you've heard today? Um, Good morning, and uh, thank you very much for everything you've shared with us. Uh, my name is Diana. I am from Jordan. I have a couple of questions, but I'll be brief. Um, first, um, it's open to anyone to answer, but what do you do when w the governments that you work with are in disagreement with your findings, uh, when they don't find them uh, something that they agree with? And then the second one I noticed in the map that you shared of the countries that the only um, Arab state present was Tunisia. So I was wondering if uh, you could share more on your experience with that. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, we'll take one more and then and then we'll move to the panelists. I think that, that one was for you, Wallace. Okay, hi, um, good morning. My name is uh, Mohamed Rudman from Nigeria. My question is uh, to Professor Wallace. Thank you so much for the presentation. What are the factors in your experience in terms of the countries that are ranking high in the maturity index that they are doing right? You know, is it that the buy-in from the higher stakeholders? Is there a coordination center? Because it looks really complex in terms of managing cyber security for a country. Is there a coordination body that we have that made them successful? You know, because some of the countries that are really ranking low, we, we need, maybe they need to learn out of that um, experience from the countries that are ranking high. Thank you. Can I go ahead for my question? Okay, thank you. <laughs> so I'm Dauda from uh, Senegal. Uh, I just have two questions. Um, you, 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 you talk about the Cyber Security Center for South Africa. Uh, are there any steps or requirements to set up one in West Africa? But I don't know, we don't have any in West Africa. And uh, the other question is, uh, yeah, knowing that uh, the cyber security um, maturity assessment is very important and is a key point on cyber security, uh, can like us, a l um, civil society organization or private company, can move forward and implement that uh, that part? So I mean the the, the cyber security um, maturity assessment. Thank you. I think we'll leave it there, and then we'll do another round of questions after. Um, but Wallace, most of those were for you, so I'll, I'll let you start. Okay. Uh, more interesting I mean this means difficult <laughs> good questions so what do you do when a country doesn't disagree with you so I think the important thing to note is that the CMM is owned by the country not by the C3C or other people who do it so we are doing it as a service to the uh, to the country so, I mean, there's, I mean, I didn't show uh, some other website, we can find lots of reports, but other reports are not there. So some countries choose not to put up their reports. Maybe they're not comfortable with the outcome yet or the other political issues going on. So before we finalize the report, we engage with the country. So, okay, this is our report, what do you think? So we go through that engagement and uh, we try to stick to the truth. So, I mean, it's not going to change to suit a country. So I think what happens in most cases is that the reports are not published. So the report is there, but the country just says, we'll keep it, we'll publish it. Um, in terms of the Arab states, I'd, I've got no answer to that. Um, what I have to say is that SMM is often initiated country. So when a country wants to do SMM, then they approach a service provider and then would do it. So it may mean that there's been no um, uptake 
from the Arab countries to, to do a same work. But again, I should emphasize that same M is just one of the many tools. There are other tools I mean, which people use. So it's possible that the other countries are opting for different assessment tools. So maybe they're not opting for this one for uh, whatever reason. Um, sometimes SMM is well, initiated by a donor. So what bank would say for us to engage with you further? Maybe you can, can we have a CMM or whatever assessment? So maybe it may depend on the other factors which may not be pushing the Arabic, uh, I mean the Arab world into into this. Um, the other question was about uh, the can one set another uh, center in other parts of Africa? I think so. I think one could. I mean, so far we have got three centers uh, in Oxford, in Cape Town, and in Melbourne. Um, I think what we realize, I mean, doing CMMs, especially north of Africa, was a cultural difference with south of Africa. I think uh, so. I guess maybe people in specific areas could set up a similar center to do with contextual issues. Uh, the civil society one, so SMM covers different bits, even civil society is part of the, the assessment. So I think maybe Chris was mentioning that in Malawi they had civil society as part of the people participating uh, in this. Uh, in terms of okay, doing the same, um, I think I mean, we're looking for an independent person outside the normal structure. So yeah. I think I've missed your question. I didn't give, did I answer it? What was your question? Okay, yes, yes, yes. So, um, so this is a tricky statement to make. If you look at the same M's, you see okay, that there is a correlation between economic development and maturity. In most cases, I think the richer countries do better than the, uh, so, but if I would have to pick a lesson looking at what we've done, it's the political will which makes a difference. If people at the top are willing to invest, because I mean, these things will require money to set up a set to do this policy. So if you've got political will, things, uh, things have been working well. Yeah. Just to add on the first question, in terms of uh, what should you do if we, yeah, okay, basically the, the CMM is bringing just a debate within the country because um, the views that are coming from the stakeholders who have been consulted. And then it looks at the country. So it's, it's up to the country to look at the, what has been said and then uh, move some steps. Uh, one issue which I want to say is uh, I think CMM, the report, further helps to bring an awareness, especially to the policy makers, because you, you debate on the findings to look at look what it, the report is saying and as a country, what should we do? So it's a report that can be used to negotiate with the policy makers to implement certain issues so that the country moves on. So mainly, it's a country can look at it and then debate. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. Thank you, Wallace. Um, okay, we have two, three more questions in the room. And remember, um, the translators can uh, relay any questions to Colonel Barros as well, if you have questions for him. Okay, thank you. Um, this is Chukomeka from Nigeria. Uh, my question goes to either um, the um, Brigadier General or Prof. Uh, it's around, uh, have you had experiences of sub-national um, running the CMM in any way, just to learn from that, any sub-national, whether from Brazil, because Brazil shares very similar experience um, with Nigeria in terms of um, the country's uh, output and the federal and state um, system all being almost um, different from each other. So just to learn from that experience, any sub-national, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, colleagues, you know, for, for the feedback. And uh, I particularly appreciate the, the model that you shared with us and all the different sectors that are involved in it in terms of assessing uh, national cybersecurity uh, maturity. 
Uh, my, my question, one of the questions I'd meant to ask related also the question that he raised with regards to civil society, because when uh, Chris mentioned the stakeholders that they engaged with in 2020, there was no mention of civil society. So I wanted to find out if there was a specific reason why civil society was not included, or maybe it was just omitted in the slide. Uh, but also to ask, um, because also that was linked to um, your area aspect that, you know, as part of the assessment to engage stakeholders as part of focus group discussions, and I'd meant to also ask which stakeholders are um, also involved as part of that assessment. Uh, but also to ask for both of you um, in terms of um, wha what's your position with regards to uh, mainstreaming uh, human rights and a, uh, and a human-centric approach to cybersecurity. And I'm asking this because I've noted that most um, states, particularly in Southern Africa, I, I work with the media of Southern Africa, so work strongly with countries in Southern Africa, that when they engage on conversations relating to cybersecurity and cybercrime, more emphasis is placed on national security and not on the human-centric approach. So what is your position in terms of mainstreaming that human-centric approach and mainstreaming human rights? And for you, Chris, is that reflected also maybe in Malawi's uh, national strategy? Thanks. Thank you. I think we have one from back here. Thank you very much. Uh, insightful presentations from Mr. Band and Professor. Mine is on uh, reforms for uh, legislation. So I note that most of the times, especially in our jurisdiction, I'm from Zambia in that region, our focus is on legislation. But I feel there's a critical stakeholder that is left out when we are doing the, these assessments or when these assessments are being conducted, and that is the judiciary. Uh, I say so because we've been talking about uh, the other arms of government, the executive which sets up these administrative processes. You talk about uh, the, the legislature, which the, the lawmakers essentially. But constitutionally speaking, the, the, the body task for administration of justice as well as interpretation of the same laws we're speaking about is the judiciary. Where are they in the picture in, in relations to capacity building, in relations to cybersecurity awareness and interpretation of the laws that we're coming up with? Thank you. Thanks very much. I think we'll leave it there for this round uh, and then come back and do one more, including from the chat. But uh, Wallace, if you want to kick off. Okay, so thank you for the for the question. So I think for the subnational one, I mean, as far as I know, we haven't had or our courts haven't done subnational assessments. So I think they've all been at at national level. So that's what. Uh, but there's been, I think there's no reason why not to do it at subnational. Uh, the the way the the framework is designed, one could use this at. Uh, subnational level. We have used the framework to assess the region, the SADC region, for example. So I, I think the way it's designed can be used at a lower level of, uh, of government. Uh, which stakeholders? So the way the stakeholder engagement works is that um, we have got a recommended list of stakeholders to say, for this dimension, we are looking to talk to these people. And I mean, that includes the judiciary, uh, by the way. So the country, the, invite, the host country, will engage with the stakeholders to invite them to come to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the meetings. So I think what we've seen, that the participation is generally good, I mean especially from the civil servants, and I mean the other factors which affect participation, but I think participation has been generally good. Um, we don't have many civil society attending, but they're included on there. And I've seen many, civil and some of them attending and, and engaging. You're talking about human rights, administering human rights. So if you look at the dimension two, dimension two talks about society and, uh, and those issues. So that touches on human rights and human rights violation. Uh, also on the dimension four on the legal frameworks that again speaks to, uh, to human rights. Um, so we've seen in Africa where we have got experience, I think one of the human rights issues is the internet shutdown. Governments, I think when they're annoyed with somebody, they shut down the internet. So that pops up in our conversations. Uh, we've seen, I think, lots of variations via online or uh, the opportunity.
opposition being shut down on online. So uh, all those things pop up in the maybe through dimension two and dimension four. So those things will pop up in the yes. So I think uh, my colleague from Zambia. So do you mean dimension four is uh, focuses on the judiciary and actually covers the aspect of uh, the, the judiciary, whether they are well trained, uh, what laws are there in place, and, and so on. From my experience, we don't have many judges or magistrates coming to the uh, discussion, but we do invite them, but maybe there are other, other ways we have to engage with them. But we get lots of lawyers coming, and they're often very vocal in most of the, the dimensions. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe on my presentation, I, I just put in like a general, like okay, it was a consultative process, but specifically, I would say yes. Uh, civil, se uh, civil society is very key, especially on the pillar is number two on awareness. So we we also engage them, uh, and especially as I say, we had some sessions. Uh, for the 2020, which even the 2016, uh, we, we had a specific session for civil society again to have an input on the, the issue. So yes, I that issue was considered and even the report, uh, things are being looked at from that angle. And some even civil society that have taken a keen interest to follow the issue uh, on cyber civility. Uh, from Zambia, um, I would say uh, yes, as uh, Professor Chigona has said, is uh, judiciary law enforcement is a key issue. Uh, I'll give example from our strategy. Uh, one issue which has been put in place is to train this as an action point, uh, judiciary law enforcement. And uh, even the previous uh, assessment also uh, looked at that and we have planned some specific training for this category, like uh, judges, uh, prosecutors, and even the, the law enforcement. So it's trying to address that area, but anyway, it's an ongoing issue. Uh, I think the, the major challenge comes now in terms of uh, um, the capacity within the institutions locally. Uh, you find that normally uh, you would want maybe to train someone who go maybe abroad. I think as he has put, like maybe developed countries, they are more advanced in these areas. But it's an issue, indeed, which needs a uh, special interest. Uh, I'll give an example. Maybe I think you may recall Malawi had the, um, uh, a case, uh, I think, on election. And one of the issues which was uh, uh, came along was the evidence on the uh, digital evidence. Uh, you find that, okay, I was so interested to listen to the whole case. But when it come to this issue, all lawyers from the defense and the, they just said, I will not comment anything, meaning they don't understand anything and other issues, even the judges. So it's, it's a challenge that requires special interest on this area. That's why, as I say, there's a, an action point. I think we've planned some activities to address, to start to address the issue, but uh, it's a, a long-term issue, and it requires a multi-stakeholder approach to, to, to address the same. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, I just wanted to check if Colonel Barros has anything he'd like to come back on that he's heard since uh, since the Q and A started. So do do come in, Colonel. If so, if not, I have one question from the room and a question at the back there, and then uh, a third one. And the one from the room, in fact, I think he's going to speak is from Dr. Martin Koyabi of the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise. Uh, he says, um, Martin, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, I don't know whether you can hear me in the room. Thank yeah, you. We can definitely hear you. Um, uh, go ahead. Yeah, first of all, thank you, Sam, and of course, uh, for chairing this wonderful session. Uh, the panelists, whom I know very well, uh, Christopher, Professor, and also, and the colonel. Uh, mine is just to give uh, a perspective, but at the same time also to ask the panelists whether that perspective is valid in looking at it. We've been working uh, tirelessly within the, the AU and GFCE project on uh, assessing the needs of each of the 55 countries in Africa, but at the same time looking at 
where we can be able to improve the gaps that we've identified. And one of the areas that we've seen is the issue around the UN uh, open-ended working group uh, process and how countries can be able to be involved in that process when it comes to issues cyber uh, diplomacy and also issues on cyber norms. So the question really would be, would that particular requirement be a metric that could be measured within the CMM structure and what the panel thinks of this particular issue? Because that's one gap that we've identified within the study that we've had in the last two years within the continent. The other aspect is also the issue around building the South to South uh, capacity, because as you mentioned, we do need experts who understand CMM. We need experts who can be able to help countries to forge ahead with the CMM. And what we are seeing increasingly is how we can get some certi certification of these assessors. So the question really would be, have we reached a point where we can have a certification process of the assessors so that they can conduct this process, whether in Brazil, whether in Japan, whether in the Pacific, or anywhere you know within the world, so that we can be able to get CMM more popular, especially in the Arab countries, as mentioned in the room. And then finally, it is the issue around the way we need to progress the ways the assessments are done. Here we have countries that have gone either in the second assessment, some of them are planning for the third, but I think right now we have, I think Malawi is one of the countries that has, has had actually two assessments so far. And the question is, when you conduct these assessments, then that means you are trying to review your posture for the last four years. There is also the issue around taking the impact of that particular process. Now, the question that I want to ask the panel is whether we should be able to include impact assessment as part of our assessment continuously. Because when you come to the four-year review period, you would want to see what was the impact of the cybersecurity implementation process that you had previously. And I'll give you an example. In Uganda, for example, in 2014, I was involved in the first uh, CMM assessment in the country. And when we did an assessment four years later, it was possible to see that the implementation of some of the laws has actually Im improved prosecution of people with digital, uh, let's say, misdemeanors and so forth. So therefore, Impact assessment is a very important measure, and therefore the question to the room, and I know Professor, we've discussed this before, is where that can be done. But thank you again for this particular opportunity, and I also want to thank the panel, and also for Sam for your very uh, good, good chairmanship. Thank you, bye. You can hear me? Oh, there we go. Thank you very much for your question, uh, Dr. Koyabi. And we've now uh, got another from the room. And then we'll take one more and, and go back to the panelists. Thank you Hello. very uh, much. Thank you. Uh, my we name will is now uh, move on to the next question. Looking forward to the future of a post-COVID. Can I proceed? Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Mahajwini. I'm uh, artificial intelligence uh, re researcher for policy. I come from Tunisia, and uh, I have a comment uh, regarding my country. Uh, as uh, you know, uh, there are a coup d'état happened in Tunisia last year, and since that coup d'état, uh, it causes a lot of. Uh, political instability, uh, human rights abuse, and the uh, cyber security, it was in somehow used kind of pretext by Tunisian government to unlock our access to government data. So uh, since the coup d'etat till now, we cannot access to, to uh, government uh, data and we cannot do any ca kind of activity. In general, there are no any public participations and uh, uh, civil society engagements due to the coup d'etat and due to the new dictator regime uh, happens in Tunisia. I hope that you can uh, consider this in your uh, presentations. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And then we had one more question from the room. Um, where was it? Um. Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Obiama. I'm from Nigeria. My question is to the professor. You mentioned the other time that um, some countries are not actually comfortable having their assessments uh, being public. So I want to ask, in this instance, when um, such countries exist and um, 
as a civil society organization or probably as a private sector, what roles can you do to assess this CMM assessment and get to uh, probably advocate to get the government to do the needful when they are ranking low in this instance? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll hand over again first to Professor Jagona um, and then to Chris and then move to Colonel Barros and then I suggest we leave it there as we're running up to time. Okay, so let me begin with um, the civil society question. Or maybe the question is more what happens after after CMM. So after CMM, I mean, we've got the report and give to government, and government then decides what to do with, uh, with the report. We have got no powers beyond, beyond that. Um, we may recommend or link government with other training, other agencies to provide training, but we cannot uh, influence what happens in the country. But uh, moving back, before we do the, the report, there's the whole consultation, and often civil society is involved. So I guess maybe civil society can hold the government to account to say there was that assessment. What happened to that, uh, I mean to that report? Because usually I think after an assessment, it's about two months or so, the report should be ready with the government. So if it's not coming out, I think civil society maybe should take it up with the government to do this. And okay, that would be useful as part of the contribution of uh, holding government uh, to account. So, Another thing which, which happens, maybe I think uh, partly answering to uh, Martin's question and maybe the, the Tunisia question. After, after a report, and then people often have another assessment. So I said, why do people have another assessment? Sometimes I think it's that governments change. So I think often I've got a case where a government ordered the same memo, asking for the same memo, you did it. And then that was given to the government. But then meanwhile, the government has changed. Now the new government says we cannot use that report by the previous government we want to have our own. And then, like in the end, I mean, find that okay, the country hasn't moved, but we have another report. So if you check the two reports, maybe four years apart, you find the same things which are recommended previously are still, are still happening. So there are sometimes there are other political issues which uh, come into play. So maybe having this review uh, this assessment may help to force governments to to act before the next one. So I do agree we need ways of uh, not forcing, of nudging governments to uh, to act on the on the recommendations or to engage on the recommendations. Uh, I do agree I think we need much more South South House collaboration on training. I think that would improve capacity. So the issue back to, to my colleague here about which countries are doing better, I think it's where people have got the training and capacity. So if I've got training locally on South-South collaboration, I think that would uh, help uh, with uh, many things. So I think I'm good. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Maybe I just want to also make a comment on the civil society. I think we are coming from different countries. Um, one issue uh, maybe I've noted within my country is lack of uh, um, uh, civil society who are doing advocacy on cyber security. Uh, it could be due to knowledge or whatever, but I think uh, we don't have such strong civil society who can take government to task on certain issues, especially related to cyber security. Maybe so again, it's a new issue which is just emerging, but it's something that needs to be considered and then maybe uh, things can be looked at from that angle. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, Colonel Barros, do you want to come in on anything we've discussed so far? If not, then, then we probably do have time for a couple more questions. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll pause for a few seconds just, uh, just to let you jump in. Okay. Yes, uh, yes, I'd oh, like to, I'd like to comment ahead. on the questions. Yeah, uh, please go ahead. Questions uh, were all very interesting. And perhaps I could uh, add some information about the Brazilian uh, case based on the Brazilian uh, reality. 
uh, regarding uh, the idea of uh, involving all different spheres uh, of uh, the government considering the size of Brazil, for example. We have been making efforts uh, towards that, uh, working more closely together with local governments. And during my presentation, I uh, commented on uh, the sectoral uh, approach and the fact that our sectoral uh, organizations or agencies engage with the states in Brazil and considering uh, uh, the recommendations that we have received from uh, CMM through the Oxford report, uh, we expect to uh, be able to share that information and that knowledge with uh, the states and apply those recommendations to the specific realities of each state in Brazil. And as I mentioned earlier, each state in Brazil it has its own uh, cultural uh, peculiarities, has its own uh, infrastructure issues, including, uh, for example, access to the internet. And the challenges may change as a result of that. And confirming what has been uh, presented here today, uh, these studies take into account all different scenarios, uh, not only from a government perspective, but also from uh, uh, the perspective of uh, civil society and academia. And uh, in this context, uh, the information that we receive is very rich in terms of uh, completeness. And as I mentioned, uh, I mentioned that bill of law that is uh, currently being reviewed. The idea is that we'll have a, a national law that will apply to all different sectors in the country and all different branches of power. Uh, and the idea is to make sure that all these intentions and all these recommendations reach all different levels of uh, power. And this would, of course, have an impact on society. Uh, here in Brazil, uh, we have uh, uh, been uh, making efforts to get closer uh, and work more closely together with civil society because uh, we are aware and we are suffering uh, the impacts of uh, cyber frauds and cyber crime. And this has been in, uh, on the radar for the government and for a number of different organizations in Brazil. So we believe that these recommendations proposed by uh, CMM, this is very important. And we are considering how to make sure that this applies to people's day-to-day uh, -day lives. Uh, and also to uh, raise awareness among uh, the population and educating the population so that when they use um, the internet or a number of different services online, that as uh, citizens uh, themselves, they uh, seek, uh, let's say, a more secure approach and they adopt secure behaviors. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Colonel Barros. So we, we do have time probably for a, a couple more questions. One there. Um, fantastic. Hi, firstly, thanks to the panel for uh, everything so far. Just uh, one question on um, sensitive information. Uh, I wondered how you work with uh, countries who have concerns over sharing uh, information uh, with you and how you sort of mitigate that. So that's actually a big, uh, it's, a, it's a big concern of many countries, the, the fear that their sensitive information will, will be going wrong hands. Especially I think on dimension four, on, on security and those kind of issues. I mean, we've had countries beg and say, okay, but can you do the assessment on the three dimensions only? I don't touch, I don't touch this dimension. Uh, so the first step is that, um, the consultations I held in a in a classroom, 
and the recordings are secured like i mean very secure so that means they don't leak out so that's uh, one one state one thing we do uh, so and again i should sort of emphasize that we don't actually assess the actual hardware or software in the country so all the information we are gathering is based on the information the country is providing to us so the risk of us touching something too sensitive is a bit minimal in in the in the first place uh, so the other part is that whatever we gather i mean kind of we go back to the country say country we have had this this information this is our report and they could say maybe this part can you not include it in the final report which is going to go public so i think we can engage with countries on those sensitive issues we are aware that other things may be too sensitive to be in the public domain but we are not touching any hardware or any software we are assessing based on the feedback from the Thank you. Uh, Chris or Colonel Barros, do you have any thoughts about what you'd like to share on how Malawi or Brazil uh, addressed, addressed uh, information sharing concerns? Uh, no, we didn't have any issue as he has explained. Many it was uh, uh, asking people, uh, maybe asking questions and on s those uh, five dimensions. Uh, basically, we didn't have uh, as an issue. However, how we are arranging the maybe the sessions? Let's say we are dealing with the, the law enforcement, maybe the security agencies. It means we we'll put in a group, uh, then we address the issues, uh, tag into that. So we are approach wor was more of sector based, maybe uh, interest based rather than the channel. Like maybe the telecom operators again, we we'll group them, we ask them. So I the debate was like in that kind of issues where by uh, everyone could be able to share information within the, uh, the, the, the sector. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And then finally, uh, Colonel Barros, we're going to wrap up now. So if you have any remarks on that or anything else, then, then please do jump in. No well worries. Be, uh, Go ahead. Very brief. Sorry, and go I ahead. I concur. I agree with what my colleagues uh, have said. Uh, in the case of Brazil, the work of uh, this CNN uh, team was exemplary, and we did not face any issues of uh, uh, any sensitive information being compromised. And just adding to uh, what was said uh, in our partnerships, in addition to signing MOUs and seeking partnerships, we also uh, sign uh, specific agreements on sharing classified information so that we can uh, have a common understanding of how uh, classified information is treated and consequently, this will enable us to uh, uh, try to process this information based on uh, experience and on best practices regarding uh, how this type of information should be treated without compromising Brazil or putting our partners at risk. That's it. Okay, uh, thank you, Colonel Barros. I think we will leave it there for today. Um, just to say a huge thank you for everyone to joining. I hope you found it a useful session. If you have any follow-up questions or something you'd like to discuss in more detail, then uh, Professor Jagona, Chris, and myself will be around, and I can also put you in touch with Colonel Barros as well. Um, but please join me and give the, our panelists a round of applause, and thank you for their presentations today. Thank you, Sam. Thank you.